Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear the latest on a threat to the state's citrus crop. NAFTA is 20 years old. We'll talk about the trade agreement's impact on the economy, and we'll learn about an organization that uses music as a healing process. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. State agricultural officials are worried about an insect that poses a serious threat to Arizona's $37 million citrus industry. Here to talk about the Asian citrus psyllid is John Caravetta, Assistant Director of the Arizona Department of Agriculture. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. You too, Ted. Thank you. We talked about this about a year or so ago, and so far everything was kind of... It's still out there, isn't it? It is, and actually, it actually became a bigger problem in the southwest part of the state this last fall when the populations of, of this particular insect just exploded and got ahead of our ability to go ahead and treat it and try to keep it uh, uh, completely eradicated or suppressed. Well, let's talk about this Asian citrus psyllid. How big is this? Can you see it? Does it fly around? What are we talking about? Well, it's about the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen, so it's very, very difficult to see with the naked eye if you're just looking for one. But in a tree where there may be multiples of these, you can see them because they will, they will jump around off the tree. Uh, you can physically see them move around. And so it's, it's very easy to see once you have a population that, that's really large and, and takes quite a few of them to do that. So they don't they're, not, they're not buzzing around so much as kind of hanging in, on the leaves and jumping and bouncing around. They're kind of quiet but they, they, uh, their numbers are pretty evident. They fly around like gnats when you, when you start to see them in a tree. And there we see, uh, there's a thumb. Boy, that's a small little insect, isn't it? They are, and they're, they're always perched at that angle like that with their heads down towards the leaf to feed, oh and their backsides are up in the air, so a little easier to see that way. So where did this insect come from? What's, what's the story behind this thing? Well, it's, it's come from Asia is, is one uh, version of, or one type of this particular pest. The other type has is, is come from Africa, and it depends on, on where you're, you're located in the globe as to what type you have, and we have the Asian uh, variety here. How did it get here? Well, that's a good question. Uh, with the global economy that we have and the trade, uh, that's one opportunity. The other opportunity is uh, through the Caribbean and, and areas where they, where they did establish and through hurricanes is a great way to, oh my to spread them as well. So Mother Nature helps out in that regard a lot of times. They can blow around that much in the wind, huh? that far too. Th they can actually with, with good prevailing winds. They're pretty good flyers, but they can be helped along with these prevailing winds. So how do you know um, if the, obviously if you see it, you know it's there, but if you don't see it, how do you know the citrus tree is infected? You will know if a citrus tree is infected uh, with the citrus greening disease, essentially when the tree starts to absolutely decline, the fruit starts to look gnarly and uh, has a very bitter uh, cough syrup-like taste to mm. it you will have some indication that that could be one cause. Now, the disease does not occur here in Arizona, so it won't be anything that anyone would see very commonly, but there's a lot of other uh, diseases and insect damage, particularly this time of year, that may mimic some of the symptoms that we're looking at when we're talking about citrus greening disease in particular, which is spread by the Asian citrus psyllid. And it sounds to me like the Yuma County's got this. We've seen it in Lake Havasu around that area. We've seen it all up the west side of the state in the river cities. We We've seen the Asian citrus psyllid. We have yet to find the psyllids uh, in central Arizona, and also we have yet to find the disease here in Arizona as well. And is there a quarantine in effect anywhere? The quarantine remains in effect in most of Yuma County okay. and in, in Mojave County and parts of La Paz County as well, where the residents are restricted from moving fruits from their backyards and moving uh, citrus trees uh, out of those quarantine areas to areas, let's say, in central Indiana, central Arizona where we don't have the psyllids. They're precluded from moving those. So those of us here in central Arizona with backyard citrus, be they tangerines, lemons, limes, oranges, whatever, should we be worried? Should we be on the watch out? What, what do we do? I think it's always good if you really want to preserve that tree in your landscape and you enjoy that production from it, that you consider the tree's health overall in any situation. And so keeping up with its nutritional demands 
working with your nursery or local extension office on how to care for your citrus trees is, is very appropriate. And they're very much in tune with what are appropriate treatments to deal with some of these insects that plague citrus to begin with, which also would have an effect on controlling Asian citrus psyllid should we have a problem here in central Arizona. Well, that's a good point. I mean, if, if you got, if your citrus trees, for whatever reason, not looking too hot, maybe they look a little bad here, a little green there, are they more susceptible to something like this? A weaker, less healthy tree is always more susceptible to further damage, whether it be from disease or insects. And it's very important that if you see something like that, that you contact either the State Department of Agriculture or your local county extension or even your nursery with a picture or uh, a call and say you have a problem that you'd like someone to look at. Should we be wary of citrus plants that we see at, at you know, everything from Home Depot to some of the, the private nurseries, the independent nurseries here around town? I mean, obviously some of these things are grown here in Arizona. Some aren't. They come in from California and other areas. Should you be a little bit worried about that? Not, a, a, absolutely not. It's a very highly regulated industry. And if you do purchase it from those outlets, you're buying product that's clean, that has been verified that it doesn't present a problem to the homeowner that's going to go plant it and receive it. Uh, the bigger challenge is make sure you get instructions on how to care for it properly so you can enjoy it in your landscape. And uh, we keep talking about backyard citrus because some of us do have a, a lot of citrus in our yards. But the industry as a whole, how important? Citrus is one of the five C's. Is it still one of the biggies here in Arizona? It is, it is a big one. It has certainly more potential than, than what we see uh, out there in the industry currently. It's, it's about $37 million in sales uh, is what it represents as far as an economic impact to Arizona, uh, as well as the impact on the communities where commercial citrus is produced and the, the employment opportunities that are presented there and the value of citrus not only to the five C's but also to those communities as well. Is the citrus industry growing in Arizona though? Because with all the, the, the land development it seems like a lot of these orchards, a lot of these, these areas where the, the trees used to grow are not growing anymore. And we've seen a decline in the number of citrus acres in the state and generally that is partly because of land redevelopment and reuse of, of land that was originally in those citrus groves. But also we see changeover in the industry as well as they move towards new varieties per, perhaps that, that may be more marketable or more attractive to consumers uh, or may present uh, other export opportunities as well. Those are all opportunities that we have uh, in our great state. So last question, how serious at this point is this to Arizona's citrus groves? It is absolutely exceptionally serious situation with the, the, the psyllid population that we have and the efforts that we're trying to do to contain it. And we need the public's involvement not to move citrus, not to move citrus plants, uh, unless they get them from those outlets that you mentioned. And that'll help keep Arizona citrus healthy, not only for the commercial citrus industry, but for the homeowner as well. All right, good information. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, us. Ted. The North American Free Trade Agreement went into effect 20 years ago as a way to eliminate investment and trade barriers between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. An international conference examining the impact of NAFTA will be held later this month at ASU. Joining us now is Jonathan Coppell, Dean of ASU's College of Public Programs. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ted. Let's, before we get too deeply into this, let's get some definitions out. What is NAFTA? Well, I think most people are generally familiar with NAFTA, which now passed 20 years ago. The idea was to create a free trade zone between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. 
as you certainly remember, it was a controversial, mm -hmm. uh, it was a controversial move at the time, and the, the goal was to create more flow of goods and services uh, in North America. Have we seen that, a, a better flow of goods and services, A, and B, have we seen some of the fears that were uh, expressed 20 years ago realized? Absol absolutely, there's clearly been a dramatic increase in trade amongst the, amongst the three co countries. Uh, the question of whether the fears have been realized is a difficult one to answer. You'll, you'll recall famously Ross Perot talking about the giant <laughs> sucking sound Indeed. Um, from the South. That hasn't been realized in nearly the dramatic fashion that was envisioned. Um, there has been some loss of jobs in the United States in that period. There's also been some gain of jobs. So it's very hard to figure out what the cause and effect is. Obviously, there's been other things going on besides NAFTA in the last 20 years, information technology, trade with other parts of the world, and so on. So it's a, it's a difficult thing to parse out. But is there a net loss of jobs, a net loss of companies since the early 90s? It, to Mexico? Or, I mean, well, to, it just, just in the United States. I think certain sectors clearly have lost jobs. Because, I mean, because of NAFTA? No, I think that's the point. It's very hard to, you know, it's very okay. hard to pin NAFTA as the villain. I mean, as, as you know, our trade with China and other parts of the world have dramatically increased in that period of time. So this, this border conference here, what, what exactly is the goal? What are you guys going to be talking about? So basically the question is to assess NAFTA 20 years after the fact and say what's worked, what hasn't. So ask some of the questions that you've asked mm -hmm. um, and ask some of the questions that are even really more practical. That is to say what's standing in the way of this working better. That is to say I don't think anybody views we're turning the clock back. The question is, how can we make this work better? It seems like some of the ways you could make it work better would be improving border access. Talk to us about that, how that has changed since NAFTA was implemented. So as you can imagine, the, as the increase in the flow of goods has increased between the countries, the border access points have become stressed. And so the question of how well our Arizona economy does in a NAFTA world has a lot to do with the efficiency of our border and literally the logistics of moving stuff across a border. In the post 9-11 world, obviously security becomes a greater concern which creates another logistical hurdle. So among the issues we'll be talking about at the Trilateral Borders Conference, which I'll put in a, pleg a plug, <laughs> Please Ted, do. March 17th and 18th, it's at the Heard Museum. You can get more information at trilateralborders.org. Uh, among the issues we'll be dealing with are those very practical considerations of better operating our border crossings so that Arizona is getting its fair share of the trade with Mexico, for example. Okay, the immigration issue, the impact of immigration concerns on border access between the U.S. and Mexico. Let's keep it to between those two countries. Right. Um, slow down the process a little bit here, uh, speed bumps along the way, what do you think? I think it creates complexity, right? Because you have to factor in border security now when you're trying to when you're trying to speed the flow of goods and services. So that does put the onus on us to to combine security and efficiency. And what we've seen is that this trade this trade volume is key for Arizona. It's absolutely vital to the success of our state in the future. And right now, to be honest, we have to pay catch up with states like Texas, yeah. which have invested heavily in infrastructure and are consuming a larger and larger share of the volume between the United States and Mexico. It sounds like Mexico has to play some catch up as well. The foreign investment in Mexico, and I was looking up this story, uh, foreign investment in the U.S., 166 billion, Canada, 326 billion, and Mexico, it's only 13 billion. How do you get more foreign investment in Mexico? Well, for, for among other things, you invest in infrastructure in Mexico, which is exactly what they're doing. Right? So they've, they're significantly increasing their infrastructure capacity, in, mar in part increasing their access to the United States. And so as I mentioned, with respect to Texas, they're building highways. Right now, mm -hmm. their new infrastructure is all pointing at Texas. We need to we need to get it pointed. We need to get it pointed at Arizona. And the because because aerospace looks like it could be a factor between Arizona and Mexico. You got the oil industry down there. It seems like that's state run, so you don't know how sluggish that's going on. Um, can those things be freed up a little bit so that again that foreign investment in Mex if Mexico becomes a dynamo, an economic right. dynamo. It's got to help Arizona. Absolutely. So, so you've hinted at some of the things that people are excited about in this relationship, that there's going to be greater trade liberalization 
uh, I'm sorry, greater domestic liberalization of parts of the economy in Mexico, that only amplifies the opportunity for Arizona business to, to export to Mexico. You know, Arizona's exports have grown a lot in, the, in, in this NAFTA period, from about $3 billion in 1996 to about $8.5 billion in 2012, and it's probably higher in 2013. Disproportionately, um, the growth in Arizona's exports overall is to Mexico and Canada. Yeah. So, so we are going to benefit as, Canadi as the Canadian economy grows and the Mexican economy grows. That's only going to help Arizona. And, and I notice as well that a trans-Pacific trade deal could be in the works right. between NAFTA and obviously Pacific Rim countries. That's right. Talk about the impact of something like that. So that's, in some sense, that's the NAFTA 2.0, if you will, the trans-Pacific trade agreement, which would add a series of Pacific Rim countries to essentially to NAFTA. That will open further the horizons for Arizona's trade. You mentioned uh, Texas, and you mentioned the fact that we're a little bit behind the, the curve here. What do we, what, if I'm a lawmaker, what do you tell me is going on in Mexico that I need to be aware of and that we can do better because of NAFTA's not going anywhere? Um, how do we take better advantage of this agreement? So I will say this. So Arizonans understand this. So the, our Morrison Institute did a study and asked Arizonans what they thought of international trade in the future of Arizona, 60% said our capacity as a state to engage in international trade was critical to the state's future. So the question is, what do we do as a result? And I think part of it is the infrastructure that we already, mm -hmm. that we already talked about. I think part of it is making our businesses globally competitive. That does have to do with education. That does have to do with upgrading our facilities, upgrading our communications infrastructure, our technology infrastructure and basically creating a global mindset in Arizona. I think that, as you know, many of our legislators and our local business leaders and our local elected officials have been eagerly reaching out to both Mexico and Canada, mm -hmm. trying to build this relationship. So I think, I, think, I think Arizonans get it. Well, all right. Well, good stuff. Good luck with that conference, too. That's Thanks good. for joining us. We'll you. see you in March 17th and 18th. You hopefully. got it in there. Thanks. Very good. <laughs>she has cerebral palsy, so um, one of her hand, hands is really clenched. And so to kind of work on opening up and using her fine motor with her fingers, we have her do like little plunking on the keyboard. After working with Kristen for two years, Katie has opened up more than her hands. Yes, I used to be a, um, like a very shy person. And um, it was hard for me to vocalize my opinions. And since I've been with Kristen, I've been able to be a stronger person and vocalize my opinions and feelings more. Katie is among 300 clients who take part in weekly sessions through Higher Octave Healing. Well, we know that we're making a difference every day by the smiles on the faces when we're finished. Um, we know that we're making a difference on paper because all of our board certified music therapists track goals that are assessed by the team, families, and sometimes the clients themselves. Because I have some kind of anxiety disorders, um, it helps relax me and makes me feel better about myself. But relaxing isn't the only benefit. Meet the members of the rock band Spice It Up. Wiki's on keyboard. Caleb's on drums, and Yaya handles vocals. I check. It's excitement for me. Do you worry about messing up or no? No. How come? I don't do stage fright. At this session, they do a little Metallica and one of Yaya's favorite songs by the Cockroaches. Interns, volunteers, and staffers lend helping hands. So just like when I was 10 and learning to play French horn, 
when I first played that French horn, it did not sound great. I had to really work on those skills. And so they are working on those skills to play the instruments. The amazing thing is that's not the ultimate goal for us. The ultimate goal for us is that rock band members are able to have opportunities to socialize with peers, to communicate with peers, to do teamwork together. They socialize before practice with a game of hot potato. Whoever catches the potato answers a question. You're going to a party? You're going to a party? A friend's party? Yeah. It's rewarding. It's I get to use music, which is a passion of mine. I get to use music to help other people. And that's that's all I can ask for. This is probably one of the best therapy therapies that are out there and um they they show compassion and really care for people with disabilities and really try to help them in the best way possible. Whether that's a piano duet or a group jam session. The Spice It Up Band performed at last year's fundraiser. Higher Octave Healing also offers a spring break camp for younger children. You can find out more at their website, higheroctavehealing.org. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about an LGBT anti-discrimination ordinance passed in Tempe last week and we'll learn about plans for water reuse in Arizona. That's Tuesday evening at 5.30 on Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.